A Deliverance Story from Exodus chapters 5 to 14. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I don't know him, and I will not let Israel go. Now that same day, Pharaoh commanded his overseers, You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them find their own straw. Clearly, these people have too much time on their hands. When the quotas for bricks weren't met, the Egyptian slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers, who appealed to Pharaoh, You give us no straw, and you say, Make bricks. But he replied, Your people are lazy. Get back to work without the straw. And the Israelites understood that trouble was coming. Thanks a lot, Moses, they said. May God judge you for the troubles you have brought us. Moses complained to God, why did you even send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh, only harm has come of it, and you have not delivered anyone. But the Lord reminded Moses of the Lord's covenant with the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Tell this to the people. I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under your burdens and I will deliver you from slavery. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. But the people didn't listen because their spirits were broken and their lives were harsh. Still, the Lord gave Moses and Aaron this charge to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. You will tell Pharaoh to let Israel leave his land and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Even though I will multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. And so the plagues began. First, the Lord told Moses to find Pharaoh at the Nile. And when Aaron struck the river with his staff, the water turned to blood. The fish died and the land stank and the people were desperate to drink. Seven days later came frogs in the houses and beds and kitchens of Egypt. And then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, plead with the Lord to take away these frogs. And the Lord did. But when the frogs were gone, Pharaoh would not relent. The third plague came as gnats. And after the gnats came flies. And the Egyptian livestock died and the Egyptians were afflicted with boils and the land was pounded by hail and eaten by locusts until Pharaoh's servants begged him, get rid of Moses and his people. Can't you see that Egypt is being destroyed? The ninth plague was darkness, absolute darkness for three days. I will bring only one more plague, the Lord said to Moses, and afterward Pharaoh will let you go. And Moses gave Pharaoh one final message. Thus says the Lord, at midnight I will go out in Egypt and every Egyptian firstborn will die. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh on his throne to the firstborn of the lowliest slave. There will be a cry in Egypt such as has never been heard and never will be again. And your servants, Pharaoh, will beg me to take my people out of your land. The Lord instructed the people, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. Let every household take a lamb without blemish, a year old, and at twilight, these lambs must be killed. Brush the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and lintels of your houses. Eat the meat roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Eat it with your belt fastened and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it quickly. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt in the night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land and I will judge the gods of the Egyptians. But when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no harm will come to you. At midnight, the firstborn across Egypt died. And in the middle of the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, go. So the people left so quickly that their dough was unrisen in the bowls. And they asked their Egyptian neighbors for gold and silver and clothing, and the Egyptians let them have whatever they asked. And with all of their possessions, the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, 
some 600,000 men, and beyond that, women and children. Moses told them, This day will be one you remember, and you will keep this feast through your generations forever. When in time your child asks you, What does this mean? You will say, By a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Now God led the people by way of the wilderness, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, and by night in a pillar of fire. So they traveled by both day and night. The pillar of cloud and of fire never left them. And when the Israelites were gone, Pharaoh said, What have we done? He called for his personal chariot and a formidable army. He pursued the people of Israel and overtook them near the Red Sea. And when they saw the army, the people cried out to Moses, Were there no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? We would have been better off as slaves. But Moses replied, Fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. The Egyptians who you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. And then Moses stretched out his hand, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters divided. The people of Israel walked into the midst of the sea on their dry ground with water on their left and on their right. And the Egyptians followed, and in the earliest hours of the morning, the Lord looked down on the Egyptians and caused them to panic. Let's get out of here, they said. The Lord is fighting for these people. As morning broke, the Lord instructed Moses to stretch out his hand again, and this time the water rushed back as the Egyptians fled, and all the host of Pharaoh were covered by the sea. But the people of Israel walked straight across on dry ground, and they saw their enemies dead on the shore. And that day, the Lord delivered Israel from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the power of the Lord, and they believed. Wow, some story, right? And that's the short version. It goes on for 10 chapters. Now, I usually work pretty hard to come up with an engaging introduction to the sermon, but I decided the best thing we could do this week is just tell the story. It's one of the most remarkable stories in human history, and one that has shaped human history to this very day. But it's a story that raises all kinds of questions. Did these things really happen? What's with the frogs? And, and what's with the lamb and the blood on the doorposts? Why is the whole thing so drawn out and dramatic? Couldn't God have delivered his people in one fell swoop? And most important, what does it mean for us today? Why is it worth 30 minutes of our time? Or maybe 33? <laughs> well, I'm hoping the story and those questions are enough to get you engaged. So let's get going. There are basically four movements to the story. Bondage, chaos, submission, deliverance. We're going to move quickly, but we'll linger a bit on the first movement because it sets up the other three. The first, bondage. Now, as we learned last week, Moses met Yahweh, the God of Israel, at the burning bush, and after some resistance, accepted his commission to lead the people out of Egypt. So, with his brother Aaron riding shotgun, he arrives in Egypt and confronts Pharaoh, the most powerful ruler on earth at the time, and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. Now, actually, what he said was, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. So it's clear from the get-go that there's a power struggle going on, a sort of showdown at the OK Corral. Pharaoh hardens his heart, which God allows him to do, and he refuses to acknowledge or submit to the God of the Hebrews. In fact, he doubles down and makes life even harder for the Hebrews demanding that they make bricks without straw, and then beating them when they object. And that's the point of these first few chapters, to reveal Pharaoh's wickedness and the people's misery. 
They had arrived in Egypt hundreds of years earlier as free people chosen by God to become a great nation and to bless the entire world. But all of that's been taken away from them. And after 400 years of slavery, they've pretty much forgotten who they are and the part they're meant to play in God's story. And from what we can tell, it seems that their hearts have become a bit hardened too. There is no indication to this point that they've actually turned to God for help. And when Moses shows up with the promise of freedom, their momentary faith quickly gives way to fear and skepticism. Scripture says, When they found Moses and Aaron, they said, May the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. So it's safe to say at this point, the people are in bondage, not only to the Egyptians, but to their own fear and unbelief. So let's pause for a minute and ask the meaning question. Why is this story here and what does it mean for us? Well, we don't want to miss the meaning this story has for any enslaved people group. It exposes the suffering and brutality of slavery. It demonstrates God's desire to deliver people from it. Generations of enslaved African Americans found comfort and hope in this story, knowing that God was attentive to their suffering and that one day they too would be free. But, but on a more personal, spiritual level, there's a sense in which we're all in bondage to something. There are forces at work in our lives, internal and external, that, that hold us back, that prevent us from becoming the people we were meant to be and living the lives we want to live. Our Celebrate Recovery ministry talks about hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And the first principle of Celebrate Recovery puts it this way. Realize I am not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Powerless is just another way of saying that we're in bondage to these forces. Well, I did some poking around this week and and came across the work of cultural psychologists who have identified three internal forces that interfere with our ability to be our best selves and to achieve our goals and dreams. The three forces are guilt, shame, and fear. Guilt is all about right and wrong and is most prominent in Western cultures. Shame is all about honor and worth and is dominant in Eastern cultures. Fear is all about power and protection and manifests itself most obviously in, in tribal cultures. Uh, people who struggle with guilt are always feeling like, I did something bad. And the guilt of those moral failures becomes demoralizing. People in bondage to shame feel like, I am bad. In other words, it's not just my behavior. There's something wrong or unworthy about me as a person. And people in bondage to fear always feel like something bad is going to happen. And that fear becomes paralyzing. Now, those three forces are ubiquitous to the human condition. But, but as individuals, we tend to be prone to one or another based on our, our culture, our family, our temperament, and, and even our circumstances. And if we're prone to guilt, we, we try to prove ourselves. If we're prone to shame, we tend to hide ourselves. And if we're prone to fear, we tend to protect ourselves. And chances are you can pretty quickly name the one that most often, often holds you back. A missiologist named Jason Georges has explored the spiritual roots and implications of these three dysfunctions. And he writes, 
Sin distorts the human family by causing guilt, shame, and fear. Consequently, we chase after innocence, honor, and power apart from God. Notice the apart from God phrase. That basically is the essence of what the Bible calls sin. It's not so much about breaking rules, but about breaking a relationship. It's choosing momentarily or consistently to do life without God. But when we do that, we become slaves to our own dysfunctions. Now, coming back to celebrate recovery for a minute, it's customary in CR, as, as in most recovery groups, for people to introduce themselves by naming their struggle with alcohol or gambling or anger or whatever it happens to be. So when I visit CR once a year or so, I, I introduce myself by saying, my name is Brian and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ in recovery from self-reliance, people-pleasing, and an unhealthy need to keep busy. Now, as I wrote that out, it struck me that I've got all three dysfunctions going here. Self-reliance is all about avoiding guilt. People-pleasing is all about avoiding shame. And keeping busy is all about managing my anxiety. It's a trifecta of dysfunctionality. But how would you introduce yourself at a recovery meeting? What would you name as your dysfunction? Uh, the point I'm trying to get at in this first movement is that like the Hebrews in Egypt, we're all in bondage to something. Well, let's press on. Movement two is chaos. And here we come to the 10 plagues, a series of disasters designed to humble Pharaoh and persuade him to let the people go. Now, these aren't just random acts of mayhem. Each one is designed to demonstrate God's power over, over Pharaoh and over the gods of Egypt. For instance, the Nile was considered a god in Egypt, a source of life with its annual ebbing and flooding. Now, well, the first plague strips the Nile of its power to bring life to the land. It turns out that, that frogs also represented a deity in the Egyptian pantheon, and of course the sun, which represented the god Re. So we're not going to walk through the Ten Plagues. You, you, can, you can watch the Prince of Egypt or the Ten Commandments if you want to fuel your imagination. But they do raise the question of historicity. These aren't just unusual happenings. They are remarkable, fantastic, supernatural occurrences. Can we really believe the Bible when it reports these kinds of events? Well, the short answer, from my perspective, is yes. But the short answer isn't especially satisfying here, so let me do my preacher thing and, and make the answer a little longer. <laughs> Uh, first, as you can imagine, there's a, a broad spectrum of perspectives as to how we should read these stories. At one extreme are those who would say that these things probably didn't happen, or didn't happen nearly as dramatically as they're described here. That we need to read them as spiritual truth stories that aren't necessarily true in the historical or scientific sense of the word. Kind of like the parables of Jesus, but in an even more primitive context. At the other end of the spectrum would be the view that these things happened exactly as they are told, and that any attempt to qualify or explain away any of the supernatural features calls into question the, the reliability of the Bible as the Word of God. And so there are Christian scholars and believers on both ends of the spectrum. I would take a position somewhere in between those two extremes, believing that events like these actually happened that they were grand in their scope and supernatural in their origin and purpose, but that we can't be sure how literally to understand all of the details. I mean, these are ancient stories that were preserved and passed down verbally for many generations. 
So they're structured and told in a way that made them vivid and memorable and instructive. They can't be read the way we might read a contemporary newspaper or a textbook. For instance, the first plague tells us that all the water in Egypt turned to blood. It's a vivid and dramatic account. But it raises all kinds of questions. Was it turned to actual blood? Or, or did it look like blood because of an algae bloom or, or the red sediment that would occasionally overwhelm the waters of the Nile? Now, either one of those would be deadly to the wildlife in that ecosystem. Was it every drop of water in Egypt, including the water in people's pots and in underground aquifers? Well, we don't really know, <laughs> based on what we're told and, and the nature of ancient storytelling. But we really don't need to know all those details in order to understand and receive the divinely inspired truth that we find here. Now, one final interesting point on this, and, and then we'll move on. Archaeologists have discovered something called the Ipuer Papyrus. It's an ancient document dating from about this same time period that describes a series of natural disasters occurring in Egypt, including a line that reads, the river is blood, and reports great devastation and lament associated with those occurrences. Now, there's some debate as to whether the papyrus is historical literature or wisdom literature, but there's no debate as to its authenticity. But with all this to say, I believe we can trust these accounts to be inspired and reliable in leading us to the truth about God and His ways. Uh, one commentator puts it this way. Fixating on what happened actually prevents us from understanding what the biblical writers are claiming in their highly structured stories, that Yahweh, the creator of the cosmos, has come to set his people free. And speaking of Yahweh as creator, part of what's going on here is a reversal of the creation account in Genesis 1 where God brought order out of chaos. What's happening here is that chaos is unleashed on Egypt. The forces of nature have run amok. Pharaoh and Egypt are denying Yahweh's power and authority. So Yahweh is allowing them to experience what happens when his ruling presence is rejected. And without getting overly dramatic or pastoral about it, chaos is what we invite into our lives when we choose to do life without God, as Adam and Eve did, spoiling the order and beauty of the garden. It's right there in that first principle of CR. I admit that I am powerless and my life is unmanageable. When we resist or reject God, we find ourselves in bondage to guilt shame, and fear. And all that was good and true and beautiful in our lives begins to unravel. Well, on to the third movement, submission. In the 10th plague, Pharaoh and the people of Egypt experienced the ultimate end of life without God, death. Because Yahweh is the source of life, not the Nile God or the sun God or the frog God which means that human beings can't live apart from God, which again is an echo of the, of the Genesis account. When Adam and Eve rejected God's loving rule, death came into the world. And so on this night, as a consequence of Pharaoh's rejection of Yahweh, death comes to Egypt. That was a terrible thing. We, we shudder at the thought of it. But remember, it didn't have to happen. God gave Pharaoh nine chances to soften his heart, nine chances to serve his people by submitting to Yahweh's authority. And keep in mind, too, that, that Pharaoh is now experiencing the very thing he inflicted on the Hebrews when he demanded the death of every male baby. So that night, 
death came to every household in Egypt except those households that placed the blood of a sacrificial lamb on the top and sides of their door frames. The Hebrews were given an opportunity to express their submission to Yahweh by allowing death to fall on a lamb instead of a person. Now, I know our, our modern sensibilities struggle with this elaborate and bloody ritual. I've got a couple things to keep in mind. First, sacrifices were standard rituals of worship in every religion throughout the ancient world. We put money in an offering plate to express our dependence and gratitude to God. Ancient people put an animal on an altar for the very same reason. Kind of makes you feel better about passing the offering plate, doesn't it? Well, secondly, the, the reason for the blood sacrifice was to make clear the fact that accepting or rejecting God's love and rule is ultimately a life or death decision. By rejecting that love and rule, Pharaoh brought death to the people he represented. By placing the blood of a lamb on the door frames of their houses, the Hebrews were declaring that they were trusting Yahweh with their lives and future. So that night, death came to the land, but passed over those who were covered or protected by the blood of a lamb. Pharaoh and his people finally surrendered and begged the Hebrews to leave as quickly as possible, which meant they didn't even have time to leaven their bread. And like parents giving their kids gas money for the drive home, the Egyptians sent the people off with gold, silver, and clothing. It was such a dramatic and transformative experience that from that time to this very day, Descendants of Israel remember the Passover by retelling the story and by seven days of unleavened bread. And it was that Passover meal that became the Last Supper for Jesus and his disciples, where he announced the final fulfillment of that ritual through his death staining the top and sides of that cross with his blood. That's why we no longer sacrifice animals or put blood on our door frames. We simply accept Christ's death as a substitute for our own, knowing that he suffered the, li the consequence of, of life without God, and he suffered it for all of us. And we remember that event to this day by gathering around a communion table to share unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, as we'll do together in just a few minutes. And every time we do that, every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are declaring our trust in Christ alone to forgive us for our without God moments and to restore us to life with God now and forever. The third principle of Celebrate Recovery puts it this way. I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. In other words, and it's an expression of submission, of trust, which is the one thing Pharaoh and his people refuse to do again and again and again. Well, we've, we've covered a lot of ground so far, eight chapters worth, but we still haven't gotten the Israelites out of Egypt. So let's get to our final movement and the lesson for the week. Deliverance. So Pharaoh lets the people go. Now, there's some debate among scholars as to how to interpret the 600,000 number in the text. If it was a literal 600,000 men, that would have put the whole company at about 2 million people, which is a hard number to reconcile historically. So scholarly estimates for the number of people leaving Egypt range anywhere from 30,000 to 2 million. Uh, we just don't know. The point is, they are now a formidable people. 
But it wasn't up to Moses alone to lead them. God was with them. We're told in chapter 13, By day the Lord went ahead of them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So think about this. For 400 years, the people have wondered if God was even paying attention to them. Now, they have tangible, visible evidence of God's presence every moment of the day and every step of their journey. Well, meanwhile, back in Egypt, Pharaoh hardens his heart again. The writers want to leave us in no doubt about the defiance and depravity of this ruler. He unleashes all the fury of Egypt in an attempt to overtake the Israelites and bring them back. When the fleeing Israelites become aware of this, they panic and they begin to lose heart. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out into the desert to die? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So it turns out they're not really free yet, are they? They still think of themselves as slaves. They're still feeling the pull of their old life and and can't imagine a better future. And anyone who's ever tried to break free of, of guilt, shame, or fear knows how hard it is. Those hurts, habits, and hang-ups refuse to let go. We find ourselves drawn back to them instead of walking into a better future. Well then, with, with the Egyptians bearing down on them from behind and the sea of reeds in front of them, they are literally at a dead end. Rock bottom, as they say in recovery. And at that point, Moses says to them, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Only God can save them at this point, and he does. God tells Moses to stretch out his staff over the water. He tells the people to start moving, and he sends a strong east wind to part the waters and allow the people to cross over. Now, we don't have time to explain the variety of of explanations that have been offered as to how this happened. A whirlwind, a blockage upstream, an earthquake. The text is clear that it was nothing less than the hand of God. And once again, we're hearing echoes of the creation account. A mighty wind hovering above the waters, the separation of sea from dry land. The writers want us to see this as nothing less than a recreation, a fresh start for human beings in relationship with God. And when the waters return, swallowing up their oppressors, the people find themselves on the other side of their bondage with an open road in front of them. Scripture says, That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. They're free, finally, free to become the people of God, free to fulfill their purpose in the world. Now, they've still got a long way to go on that journey, as we're going to find out in the weeks to come. But they're on their way with God to the promised land. So here's what we're learning today from Moses and the Exodus about about our spiritual journey. We're all in bondage to something until we place our trust in the only one who can set us free. The Israelites couldn't even imagine being free of the Egyptians, let alone could they have attained that freedom in their own strength. It wasn't until they placed their trust in the God who'd come to save them that they were able to to break free from their oppressors and begin walking into their destiny as the people of God. And in a similar way, we're all in bondage to something. 
guilt, shame, fear, hurts, habits, hangups that, that keep us from becoming the people we were meant to be. Jesus Christ came into the world to set us free from all that. He freed us from shame by sharing in our humanity. He freed us from guilt by suffering the consequence of our sin. And he freed us from fear by conquering our greatest enemy, death. What the Passover and the parting of the sea meant to the people of Israel, the cross and the resurrection mean to us today. The freedom to live new and eternal life with God. Now, we've been talking a lot about things that happened a long time ago. I'd like to finish up by letting you hear from a contemporary person who found the freedom we've been talking about today. So we've asked Chris Bassett, our worship leader at the Watertown campus, to share a bit of his story with us. And then I'll come back and wrap things up. Seven years ago, I was just living at home with my parents, my mom and my dad. That's about it. I wasn't doing really anything else. And it's because I was really stuck in a very deep uh, anxiety and judgments about myself, negative beliefs about myself. I didn't have any motivation to go out and uh, move on with my life or get involved in things. So I was reading a lot of books on a lot of different topics, and I was interested in spirituality. So I came across a couple of books that were Christian-based, and it introduced me to the idea of following Jesus. So I had the beginnings of what you would call faith, this desire to follow Jesus or learn more about what that looks like. But I was still trapped in the anxiety and the fear, and I'd gotten so used to just living at home and not doing anything else that I was just stuck in that. And that eventually turned into a mental health crisis. I needed to do something. I needed to find other people who followed Jesus and uh, who I could learn from. And I found Grace Chapel. Um, and came across the Celebrate Recovery program they have here. And I also started volunteering on the tech team at the evening service. I felt vulnerable just walking into the church because of where I was coming from. So just being around other people was anxiety provoking for me. Uh, I was afraid of what people thought of me. I was afraid of being judged negatively or rejected even by strangers. Every Sunday, every time I came, or Monday night for CR, that was vulnerability for me. Everyone who goes to celebrate recovery is working on some issue that they have, and that's why they're there. The space there, I felt accepted. Um, and accepted in the state that I was, which was very quiet. I, I wasn't saying anything the first dozen times I went to those meetings. That was important for the beginning of a deeper faith, and that opened me up to start to participate more in the small groups. I was able to share in much more detail of about the negative thoughts that I was having, the, the anxiety I was experiencing, and to make some good friends who re I really felt supported by. That really helped me a lot. There was a prayer that I was reading every morning. One of those mornings, I was really struggling with the anxiety, just um, feeling very alone, hopeless. Uh, so I decided to get on my knees and pray that prayer uh, from that place of not knowing what was gonna happen next, not knowing if I was gonna get better. If I was going to feel better. And when I w read those words of the prayer, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I realized then that I meant it and I felt a sense of wholeness come into me. And I found the courage to give my testimony at CR, which is a big part of the program. And I also started playing with the praise team, uh, playing guitar and music 
is a big passion of mine, so that was really meaningful to me too. Over the last few years, there's some things that I didn't think I could do that God has led me to be able to do, which is uh, to go to graduate school, to work as a software engineer, to join the staff here at Grace Chapel. I started as the Watertown worship leader a year ago, and now I'm singing loudly most of the time on stage every Sunday morning. And I also started a role of the director of the Celebrate Recovery Ministry here at Grace and gave just this past Monday my first teaching lesson. Doing those things has given me faith beyond what I thought possible. So I still struggle uh, with the social anxiety, but I don't feel like it holds me back. That gives me a sense of freedom that comes from knowing that God is with me in whatever I'm doing, uh, every step of the way. And my faith in Him is rooted in that, in knowing He's with me and just walking with Him. Wow, that's a pretty good story too, right? We're all in bondage to something, we said. For Chris, it was primarily fear uh, and a measure of guilt and shame thrown in that was preventing him from living the life he wanted to live and from becoming his true and best self. He couldn't imagine ever being free of those dark forces until he found his way to Jesus into a relationship with God, into a community of people who are authentically seeking and following Jesus too. And now he finds himself living a life he never could have imagined apart from Christ. If you've never discovered that kind of freedom, I invite you to take a step in that direction. Maybe it means learning more about Jesus, who he is, and what his life, death, and resurrection can mean to you. If that feels like a next step, I, I invite you to take the Alpha course. It's beginning in a couple of weeks, online and in person. And maybe for you it means finally facing a hurt, habit, or hang-up that you just can't seem to get free of. I invite you to check out Celebrate Recovery. Happens every Monday night on the Lexington campus. Maybe it means declaring your faith in the only one who can set you free, trusting your life and future to Him. If you're ready to do that for the first time or the hundredth time, I invite you to join us at the communion table where we remember the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because who the sun sets free is free indeed. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for loving us in spite of our brokenness and our bondage. Forgive us for the times and ways we choose life without you. Meet each one of us here today, wherever we are on that journey and set us free to trust and follow you to new and eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.